Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Ah, Tottenham Hotspur, eh? Um, <laughs> they're just such a mad team. Um, you know, I think we all watched probably the, the Chelsea game on Saturday, saw the collapse there and saw the other results going Tottenham's way. And yet still, there was just this probably a belief that, yeah, Tottenham don't do gifts. They don't do generosity. They don't enjoy certainly receiving any of those things. Um, and, you know, I think there was just probably always a feeling that there was some way that Tottenham were going to throw that gift straight back to those who tried to give it away. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't great. You know, I'm going to try not to spend too much time on the actual match action itself because, obviously, we're, we're days past it. A couple of performances I'll talk about. Ultimately, you know... We just kind of need to dissect kind of what's going on at Tottenham right now. But what I would say, what I would say, and I want to start off as if I'm absolutely going to go off on a, a complete negative because this is where I find football so relative. Um, if any of you didn't know or hadn't seen me say about this in previous uh, videos or anything like that, my background before I covered Spurs, before I started covering Spurs, God, what are we almost at five years now. Before that, I used to cover uh, football in League Two and also non-league sides as well. So for me, and I could imagine it would be the same maybe for, for many fans of, of other clubs, you know, seeing the disaster that's been spoken about with Spurs right now and all that, the disasters I used to have to write about uh, were teams, you know, going to the wall financially, being unable to pay players, uh, potentially going out of existence and, and or even at the best dropping down three or four rungs on a football ladder just to survive. Um, and I guess it's funny, it's the way the tribal nature of football and the way we are and, and, and the way we analyse stuff, and I'm including myself massively in this as well, is that we're all going absolutely mad about a team that is three points off fourth place in the Premier League and has a cup final this month. It's mad, isn't it? It's mad. And that's not to do down people's feelings on this at all, because I certainly have some strong ones of my own. Um, but it's just mad, isn't it, when you look at football like that. And I just I just caught myself the other day. I was writing something, and I just thought, wow. You, imagine, you remember way back when you were writing about teams that were kind of going bankrupt and out of existence, or new ones having to reform out of the rubble of the old club, and you kind of think, and now we're talking about disaster of... Uh, a team in sixth, three points or fourth in a cup final. Like I say, it's mad. It's mad, but it's kind of, I suppose, part of the fun and the charm. I, I think probably deep down we know it's it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, it's our football club, I guess, is the way to put it. And, you know, we like to see it in a slightly better way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, kind of on that theme, I think I've noticed this week, certainly with what's happening at Tottenham right now, very three quite distinct camps um, have kind of emerged there's a bit of um, there's a an absolute Mourinho out group. There's the you know it's done. It's time for him to go away. We want our Tottenham back kind of group. There's the Mourinho fans, um, and I'd probably say a lot of those are you know we've spoken about this before. There's a, there's a a kind of he he has this following uh, from across the globe. Very very passionate people that follow him. Um, it's a very unique thing. It's very much like Ronaldo and Messi, but very unique in terms of you don't really see that with a manager. It's incredible. Um, who are very, very, very passionate behind him uh, in everything he does and will follow him from club to club. I think that's maybe slightly more of a norm um, in terms of following a player around the world, whereas in the UK for us, it's very alien. It's something that we're not used to. We're used to following a club and the whole saying no one's bigger than the club or the badge or whatever you want to call it. Um, but this is a very different way of looking at it. You know, obviously, I suppose probably the most similar thing for Spurs fans before is that he's the, you know, the love from Korean people for um, uh, Son Hung Min, you know, um, an absolute kind of fervor and a passion for him, which is, you know, it's lovely. It's just lovely to see that. And you see um, Korean fans making their way to the UK for match days back when they could. But it's, for us, it's a very alien concept. I was trying to think of probably the closest maybe I remember as, and this is going years back as kind of a kid, was Gaza. When Gaza went to Italy um, to play for Lazio and obviously a Channel 4 football, Gazeta Italia kind of focused on him a lot. Um, and I think maybe that, 
a lot of people kind of kept an eye. I think it's probably the best way to say it. For a UK audience, that's probably the most we go in that direction. It's keeping an eye, if you see what I mean, rather than and actually following this person with, with utter fervour. Um, and it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. They're very, very passionate people. Can go over the top sometimes, as I see on social media this week, and, and I've had that. Um, um, and then I said there's a third camp which is probably where I've maybe put myself more in. And obviously, you know, we've spoken about how I try and remain objective. And I think that's probably why I naturally sit in that camp. And that's more a person I just want to see Tottenham do well. Um, and if that's with Mourinho and it's finding a way of bringing what he's done in the past to Tottenham, then fantastic. If it's not with Mourinho and Spurs have to start again with another project, so be it. I kind of, I wouldn't say... <sighs> It's it's a really difficult one because I don't want to be patronising to anyone because everyone has their different opinions and I totally respect that. But what I kind of am seeing on social media is it's almost as if there's like a... You have to be an either or. You have to have this view on something and you can't have a view again. I mean, say for instance, uh, for me, I think the mistakes have been made by Mourinho, the players, and uh, Enoch, the ownership, whatever you want to call it. I think across the board, I think mistakes have been made... Uh, and, and nobody really, uh, or very few people, are coming out of this shining, uh, the recent kind of, uh, you know, times. So for me, I find it a little bit awkward when, let's say, people, um, let's use the Mourinho as an example, you know, absolutely defending to the hilt completely and maybe ignore things that he's not doing quite right. Um, or likewise, are saying it's all Mourinho's fault, it's not the player's fault, it's all Mourinho, you know, and also flip side saying it's all Levy and Enix's fault. For me, it's it's all of it, all of the above, as it were. Um, it's like an old film, Brewster's Millions, when he said, used to say vote for none of the above. It's a little bit, um, bit the other way around, it's all of the above. I kind of feel that, and, and I've kind of watched it play out on social media. I've got to admit... I kind of have started to not withdraw, but I kind of just got a bit bored with it all. Um, there's all sniping, and it's it's really weird. It's like um, people talk about Mourinho uh, dividing the squad. I kind of feel the fan base is quite divided right now. I feel that there's this strange, yeah, like I say, there's Mourinho fans. Um, I wouldn't say they're all just ones that just follow Mourinho. I do think there's there are certainly Spurs fans who want to see him given a chance as well. Certainly, I'd imagine a lot of people that. Um, had had enough of Mauricio Pochettino and wanted Mourinho to come in to to have a different thing. I'd, I'd imagine they will probably feel they have to back him, especially right now, because obviously they were the ones that wanted that change. Um, so, yeah, it's... Oh, I hate using the word toxic, because I think it's overused right now, but social media, yeah, it's, it's not pleasant. It's just everyone arguing, squabbling, and, uh, yeah, it's not great right now. And I think that leads to some stuff that we'll come on to later with certain players as well, getting really disgusting abuse. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where I see the Spurs support right now. Um, but yeah, let's get it a little bit deep. I mean, as always, as I always say to you guys, if I wasn't at a stadium, I want to let you know that. And that was the case on Sunday. What we do uh, because of COVID restrictions and, and travel and stuff like that, my Excellent colleague Robert Guest, King of the North, as it was a Northern game. He was up there on Sunday and I was on a very much a watching brief, watching it from home. I was watching a press conference, but obviously just letting Guesty get on with it and ask his questions and things like that. So I got to kind of just sit back and, and watch it rather than get involved and ask questions and things like that, which, yeah, I don't like it. Let's let's be honest. I was about to say there's a part of me that likes sitting back and just watching, but it's not. You know, you, you know what I'm like. I like to ask questions. I like to kind of... Um, find out more stuff and, uh, and I had to kind of do my digging in slightly different ways on Sunday but um, yeah I mean before we come to Mourinho let's start on the players I talked about there being distinct camps of things that have gone wrong so let's talk about the players um, as I always get stick for backing up backing him I want to address the performance of Davinson Sanchez on Sunday um, but obviously don't I also want to kind of touch on the really horrible stuff that happened to him afterwards so in terms of his performance, um, yeah, you know, I always, any time Devin Sanchez makes a mistake, I get various messages on social media, which, let's be honest, if they're unpleasant, you get yourself muted and I never see your, your message again. So it's, it's a funny way of dealing with it, but I get tensions are high, frustrations are high and all that. Devin Sanchez had a really poor game Sunday, really, really, really poor. You know, and my thing, as I've always said to you, is I feel he makes at least 
one mistake a game, one big mistake, and it's about whether that's a costly one or not. On Sunday, he just made a, a fair few of them. He never looked comfortable. He looked nervous right from the first few minutes. Some of his um, distribution was really poor, um, and that led to first goal. It was a poor clearance from him, which then put Spurs in trouble. Uh, Hoybier put in a really weak challenge, which was really strange, uh, which didn't help the situation. And then obviously, Ronan had come across, and that left Akers a space for him for Joe Linton. Um, and then oh, the second goal, was an absolute just, I don't even want to say comedy of errors because it wasn't funny. Um, so many people, and, and Mourinho said this afterwards, which is fair, I think, is split it into three phases and do think that's very true, especially with the second goal. Uh, Tanganga just didn't get close enough to cut out the cross. Regulon beaten far too easy at the back. He didn't even jump. It was almost as if he wasn't aware there was someone behind him. And then as Roden's trying to clear it away, Sanchez just completely loses his bearings and slams into him, taking both of them out of the way, and kind of the ball squirms its way to Willock to, to smash home. Um, absolute yeah, shambles. And bearing in mind it came, what, roughly 60 seconds, something like that, after Kane had hit the post. It was just... Spurs are conceding far too many goals in the, the latter stages of, of the games. They've... I'm pretty sure the stat was they'd concede, thrown away 11 points through goals conceded in the last 10 minutes. That's ridiculous. I know it's a bit of, you know, what ifs and, and people that don't like that sort of stuff, but you can't help but think what those 11 points would be done to Tottenham right now. You know, right up there. Um, it's just madness. And I think, I think they've conceded even more. I think there's another three goals they've conceded in the last 15 minutes, something like that psychological stuff which we'll come to later again because um i think there's kind of more reasons for that the psychological stuff they're struggling so much um i always remember pochettino in his day didn't want to employ sports psychologists within the club because he felt that his team were qualified enough to do that as in his uh, coaching staff um i think feel like Mourinho has said similar i'll have to look into that it's just kind of crossed my mind but i think he might have said something along those lines but you do kind of look at it and you think and I, I wrote a piece about a sports psychologist um yesterday uh Jonathan Veal from the Press Association did a really good little interview with a leading um I think they're technically called sports performance coaches is how they like to be known um and there's some really interesting stuff in there and you get the kind of usual replies to that of oh you know they're paid 200 grand a week they shouldn't have any mental capacity or mental issues or whatever uh, they shouldn't be scared what are they scared about we're scared of watching them and i get the frustration but that's com completely ignoring the psychological aspect if, if you concede a lot of goals in the last 10 minutes of games you're always going to worry that you're going to do it again and you make mistakes because you're nervous it's not rocket science but there is a little bit more to it which we'll come to in a bit but um yeah so davinson sanchez um he wasn't alone in having a bad day i felt um not to the same degree, but I thought Tanganga was a little bit shakier than I've normally seen him. I thought Regulon had a wasn't great at all in a defensive sense, got beaten quite a lot. I thought Roden did quite well. Um, a couple of moments where he was slightly out of position, but I felt he was the one that looked more composed in that back line. He's probably the one... Hugo Lloris made some uh, good early saves as well, but I think ultimately, I think Dan Sanchez had a really poor day. But that doesn't excuse what happened to him afterwards. And I hate to sound preachy and all this sort of stuff, but, you know, there's a part of me, and this is maybe the sad state of things, that I kind of expected he was going to end up getting racially abused afterwards. And what a crap world that that is kind of the thing you expect. Because you just, it's almost, I don't know, with social media the way it is, you kind of feel that someone's going to do that to him. Just because I think people use sometimes social media or, I don't know, something as a vehicle to maybe say stuff that they want to say regardless of football. And it's so unpleasant and it's horrible. And, I mean, obviously I saw what he put on um, on his social media feed, uh, feed and, and I believe there were other instances as well, things that were said to him. But for me, what you know, that was disgusting. Well, what what's disappointed me as well was I saw the Spurs Facebook page and um, they said about it and they said, we stand with you and all that. And it's disgusting. We'll be talking to social media companies about it. But what I kind of saw underneath was this weird need people have to say, yeah, but, 
And it's so wrong. It's so not the time to say yeah, yeah, buts. They were like, oh, it's terrible. Can't believe people do that. We should separate race and, and football and then say, but he was so awful on the day. He was so crap, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, don't say that because you're then kind of, have by all means, have a separate discussion. Discuss what you thought of his performance, where it went wrong, where it wasn't good enough, what you can prove on, all of that. Don't under a thread all about racism and some disgusting stuff that's been said to a human being that should never be said and say, yeah, but he was crap. It's because it kind of almost negates what you're saying about how awful racist abuse is because you're kind of saying, you're not quite going as far to say, oh, but I can see why they did it. But you're kind of almost giving those muppets that say that sort of stuff, those people with those kind of sensibilities about them, you're kind of almost giving them a slight legitimacy to what they're saying. I, I don't like that. I don't like that. By all means, have your separate Facebook thing about it. Have a moan. Have a whatever you want to do about Sanchez's performance. I just felt that was the wrong place. Sorry, that was such a rant. And it was so being a weird dad kind of moment kind of thing. But I, I don't like that. I really don't like that. It just rubs me up the wrong way completely. Um, race and anything, you know, it should not come into it. It shouldn't be any factor in it. I can quite clearly sit here and as someone has defended Davinson Sanchez in the past, I can say his performance was very poor. Really poor, actually. I think Guesty gave him I think Guesty gave him a five in his player rating. I probably would have given him a three or four. I thought he was really, really, really poor. It doesn't excuse anything that's said to him. A absolutely awful. If you're gonna say that sort of stuff to him, just I mean, honestly, just get away from social media. Social media is you're clearly using it for something else that you want to be able to put out there, and it's nothing to do with football. Um, horrible, horrible. Um, but yeah, touch on our players. Let's move. Let's move away from that. But um, it wasn't just defenders making mistakes. I felt attacking play. Uh, Spurs. You know, this is a Newcastle side that's struggling for confidence, uh, just teetering above the relegation zone. Tottenham should be taking that game to them. You know, they had chances. They had so many breaks. Uh, Lamella, there was various chances where he should have uh, released the ball quicker. Even the one to Harry Kane, I kind of felt he, he left it so long that Kane was in a position where it was maybe too tight for him. Uh, there was one other one where I think he should have passed on Dembele, who was racing through. Um, and even Son, you know, Son came back, which was great to see. But then... He had this strange moment, I think it was quite early in the second half, where the ball came to him, he touched it, or it was coming to him in the box, and you just thought, you're in so much space. You could either volley this or even have time to take it and put it in the net. And he kind of cushioned the ball, which I think was meant to be for Kane, but Kane was nowhere near. And it was like, Spurs are making silly mistakes at the front and back. Um, and again, I don't want to kind of dip into a subject and come to later, because I don't want to talk about Mourinho right now. We're going to come to him a little bit. But there was... I think that's a lot of his frustrations, Mourinho, afterwards were to do with that because his feeling is that the ball is being lost up front too much or in the midfield and then it's coming back and putting more pressure on the defence that shouldn't be having that. Because that's the weird thing. We can moan about the defence completely. We can say it needs reinforcements. And like I said last week, um, Spurs are looking for one, if not two, once they get some money in uh, from sales, they're looking for one or two centre-backs. One, a real leader in the, in the, in the defence for them. Yet, going into the game, I think Tottenham, after Chelsea's collapse, Tottenham were possibly joint second-best uh, defence in the Premier League. And I know they've been kind of adding players packed in front of them in some games, but still, they're probably, you know, if you're going to give Mourinho credit, I think he deserves credit for having... Con the team having conceded that few with a defence that we know is iffy. We know is very much a defence that's um, in a very much a state of transition. It's not, you know, oh, the days of Alderweireld and Vertonghen in their peak are long gone. You know, um, there's no partnership like that right now. But, um, yeah, it's just so iffy. It is so iffy. Uh, Midfield-wise... Ondembele kind of had a bit of both worlds, I thought, going forward. And bearing in mind, it, he's in a deeper role. It, it was more for the players ahead of him. You know, Lucas, who I didn't think had a great game. Um, Lucas, who's... Oh, Vinicius. Vinicius started again as well. Really, unfortunately, just didn't really make any impact on the game whatsoever. Didn't really probably do himself any favours. Um, and yeah, so you had Vinicius, you had Lucas up there as well. And obviously, Lo Celso as well. Lo Celso, as long as I didn't, it's a tough one with myself. So I think 
He had moments where he looked like he was going to do something, but sometimes his distribution was just really poor. On Dembele, for me, I feel it was meant to be more withdrawn, but actually I felt he did more in terms of creation than other players did. Uh, the no-look pass for Kane's goal was superb. Um, there was another pass for Kane at the end, which Kane ran into the just ran out of space and he and knocked it into the keeper. Um, there was loads of little dribbles, and even late on after Newcastle's late equaliser, on Dembele was just trying. He was trying to sail in past players, trying to make something happen. He was he was wanting it. Um, I wouldn't probably put as much criticism. I, I, he wasn't great defensive wise, of course, as, as Newcastle up their pressure for the equaliser, but. Yeah, I kind of saw some criticism on the man. I thought that's a little bit harsh because I thought playing in a deeper role, I felt he he did contribute. You know, he got his assist and I felt he was trying to make things happen. Hoybier was, again, quite mixed. Like I say, really weak challenge for the first goal. Um, and at little times he was at sea, out at sea a bit in his positioning. But yeah, I probably wouldn't lay too much blame on him. I'd say it was probably at, at either end, really, where where the mistakes were. And, you know... The one player I think we, you just can't let have any criticism is Harry Kane. Harry Kane for me right now is this season feels a little bit. I don't know about you guys, but it feels a little bit like Gareth Bale's um, last season at Tottenham when Get Bale under Andre Villas-Boas essentially carried the team. You know they looked to him constantly to bail them out of games. Pardon the pun where they weren't. Uh, creating much or they weren't doing much and he could just suddenly come up with a bit of magic and for me this season that's Harry Kane you know his first goal was about uh, a bit of fortune you know uh, Lo Celso overhitting a ball um, and just fortunately ricocheting back into his path to slam home but the second goal was just all about Harry Kane's class you know on the bellows lovely pass but just that little touch out of his feet and then bang straight across the keeper and into goal beautiful and that's now 29 goals 16 assists in 41 games it's phenomenal the guy tops the Premier League goal charts, assist charts. And this is why for me, and I know I've said this in the past, where I just can't see a world where Tottenham can accept anything other than a world record incredible transfer bid, which I don't think would come in for him. Because you're not replacing one player. You're replacing essentially almost like three players in one with the amount of stuff he does. He's an incredible player. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I think... For me, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's got to be player of the season, I think, isn't he? Um, and I'm not talking about Spurs, I'm talking about Premier League. A lot of players have had terrific seasons, and, and there's always this sense, I completely understand, where you know Man City likely to go on and win it, it should be a City player. But for me, what Kane's done is more incredible. In a team that's had such ups and downs, and I think he's dragged them, absolutely dragged them by the scruff of the neck up the table. Um, and where they are is, is testament to those 29 goals and 16 assists, you know. Um, he's an incredible player, incredible player. He'll be 28 this summer, um, and he's absolutely hitting his prime. Uh, Mourinho is very fortunate because you do, you wonder if you were to get a lesser striker, and, and, and when I say lesser, I'm still talking about very good strikers, but if you got a striker who was maybe more just a goal scorer, you know, with Tottenham Hotspur, where would they be in the table? It's quite disturbing. Um, he's been that good. It's been superb. Um, let's see if there's anything else I really wanted to talk about just before I go on to him. I mean, no, I think I'm going to have to go to Jose Mourinho now, to be honest. So, like I say, I was on a watching brief. I was watching the press conference. I was letting Guesty ask his questions rather than getting stuck in. I was just uh, just watching over the Zoom. Um, and I... I'm trying to think the best way to put this. When people completely un unadulteratedly adore Mourinho and don't see his faults, I think post-match comments like Sundays are the ones that they're maybe missing out on. Uh, I can totally understand how you can be frustrated and say the players let him down. There's certainly there's mistakes that have been made there, definitely. But some of the stuff after the match is just so... Unnecessary. Um, I mean, you know, there was the throwaway comment that's probably the one that's made the biggest waves was um, Radio 5 Live asked him, you know, it kind of wasn't even a question. It was more a, a statement of like, you know, your teams aren't known for throwing away leads. And he just said, same manager, different players. And it was just, oh, man, it just, 
there was that, and then there was there's another comment about I've got grey hairs because I'm witnessing things I never see at this level of football before. Um, so those, you know, I understand those kind of comments upset some of the players. Um, and there's this feeling among some players, again, you know, I'm not going to say it's all, but there's a feeling that it kind of throws them under the bus a lot. Mourinho's got this thing where he will indirectly kind of allude to the fact that, well, even stuff like that, I mean, stuff like that, that's not even direct. That's very clearly saying the players aren't good enough or the players don't have the mental capacity or whatever it is. Uh, and then in the next breath, like, Guesty asked him a question about um, how do you fix this? How do you fix this problem they're having? Is like, oh, this is not a thing I can ask answer for you. This is not for me and you to discuss. And it's almost like you kind of he's indirectly saying because I want to change player A, B or C or they're not good enough or whatever. It's like it's almost making a show of saying oh, I'm protecting them when you've already thrown them under the bus beforehand. It's like it doesn't work for me. And then we had the very, very odd um, answers about um, the whole Aldevere Ald and Aurier situation, which, again, watching on, I was just kind of watching and thinking, that doesn't make any sense. So if you'd missed this, if you were living on the moon or had, you know, somehow slept through the entire weekend, Mourinho said after the game, um, when asked why Aldevere and Aurier weren't involved again, because you, you know, mustn't forget that for the Villa game, neither player was in the squad. Club stated that both were ill. Both then went the very next morning to meet up with their international squads. You know, purely stating the facts, not saying that means anything, but just stating that's exactly what happened. So this time, neither in the match day squad again. And so they were asked afterwards, you know, because I wondered, was it because Aurier went away? Um, sorry, Aurier. Um, out of Herald went away and played the entire 270 minutes of football for Belgium. Every minute in all three games they played. Um, Aurier did the most travelling out of any Tottenham player had a great time for Ivory Coast uh, scored a goal, two assists uh, got another assist in the second game as uh, Ivory Coast qualified for the um, Africa Cup of Nations, obviously he's their captain so both had really good international breaks but I did wonder, is it because they're just in a fitness place not as good a place as everyone else and he was asked that, whether that was the case and he was like, nope, they just weren't selected and then came this story. I think there was a part of him that was maybe being defensive. Um, Pochettino was no different. Pochettino used to do exactly the same thing. Of being defensive about selections and seeing it as a, an affront to not only their own tactical uh, decisions, but also an affront to other players, which you know you might think is slightly ironic when he's kind of has thrown them under the bus. Um, Although I think maybe in Mourinho's case, he probably wasn't always picking on the defence. He's maybe a lot of it, I think, was, like I said earlier, the ball coming back at the defence and having to deal with it. Uh, but clearly individual mistakes were made. Um, so, yeah, he was given that opportunity. And then he came out with this strange thing about grouping out of and Aurier together and essentially saying they weren't involved because they they didn't they did not train until Saturday because they missed COVID tests after they came back. And then he kind of went into this thing. Like, I'm not saying it's indiscipline and I'm not saying it's discipline. Um, and it kind of said that pretty much that other players had made these tests and were involved. And I just was watching a press conference and obviously it wasn't one for me to ask a question in. But I was just like, my brain's going, I saw Elderfield. I saw Elderfield in the training photos the other day. And so obviously that made no sense whatsoever. And I immediately looked afterwards and there he is doing all the warm-up stuff on Thursday. Um with with the squad um, I mean I saw some reports saying that Bergvine was also was late back and things like that but Bergvine was also in the photos with Thursday training Aurier perhaps I don't really know the situation with Aurier certainly I haven't seen him in any training staff or, or anything but out of Herald not only was in th photos on Thursday from training but in a video on Friday was also shown in training um, so for Maria to include him and say that he wasn't training until Saturday and that's the point he didn't do any training until the very final day I mean I'm hoping we get a bit of clarity on Friday because it made no sense and I did a bit of digging and, and I was told that Alderweireld had actually you know had, had done his uh, Covid tests on Wednesday he, he was back and did all that so I really don't understand what's going on there a lot of people inside the club confused about it and like I say some players not too happy about it because they kind of feel that it's almost 
people being made to be scapegoats and, and it kind of doesn't appear to have been what he did. I mean, this is another example of maybe being slightly blind to uh, mistakes being made. I had I put a photo with my story about the Alderweireld stuff because um, Alderweireld I mean, such a strange relationship, uh, which I will come to in one second. I put this photo of Alderweireld training on Thursday, and someone underneath, obviously a Mourinho fan, not a Tottenham fan, a Mourinho fan, said, "If you're going to come out with these lies, at least show us the photos." And I was kind of, I did a silly little gif as if to go, uh, that's the photo. And then he replied, no, that's an old photo. I was like, it literally is one of about five photos that from Getty Images showing out of Herald doing the pre, like, the drills on training session. And, you know, I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand this kind of protect at all costs mentality, you know. Um I kind of alluded to there, the whole Alderweireld and Mourinho relationship is so strange. Uh, for me, Alderweireld was one of those who absolutely delighted in the fact that Mourinho was coming in. You know, he didn't have a great relationship with Pochettino. New Deal wasn't forthcoming. Um, I always always sticks in my head when Mourinho, when Pochettino had just done, uh, just gone, and I think he was asked about the possibility of Mourinho. I think it was that night. Maybe he was on international duty with Belgium, possibly. Uh, and he was so happy about the prospect of Mourinho, you could see. And obviously, within just over a month, he'd signed a new deal when Mourinho came in, and there's some really gushing interviews about him. And just somewhere along the line, he has absolutely fallen into this same thing that Mourinho has done with every... Um, to be fair, <laughs> he's done it to all of them. You know, Joe Roden, Davinson Sanchez, Eric Dyer, and Toby Alderweireld all at some point have spent long periods out of the first team uh, in the Premier League. And, and sometimes out of match day squads entirely. Um, but I think for Alderweireld, it's probably coming as the biggest shock uh, because he thought, you know, hey, I'm going to be his guy. He wanted me a man you for like a couple of summers in a row. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really strange where that relationship's going to go. I don't know. But, yeah, you know, I saw an image. Again, I don't want to say it was 100% true, but I don't really have any cause to doubt it. Alderweireld liked... Um, a tweet from the very good Belgian journalist Christophe Thurier, who who'd done a photo of him and training on Thursday and saying that you know he was there and, and had done his tests and everything. And this image seemed to show before he unliked it that that Alderweireld had liked this tweet. Um, and I can understand I can understand the players' confusion and also staff inside the club. But kind of thinking, why has it gone down this route? And I don't get it. I'm really hoping on Friday we get a little bit of clarity on it because it's going to be a really awkward question that he's going to have to answer. Um, it may well be that he meant to say just Aurier, but kind of got wrapped up slightly and, and, and what he was saying. I don't know, but we'll find out. But yeah, it's just created more issues, I think, in terms of more players being just miffed with, with comments. And and I get what some people are saying that, oh, you know, how can the players be it's upset at comments? They've been rubbish. He's right for calling them out and stuff like that. To a degree. To a degree, yes. But there, this is where I'm going to come back to the fear factor thing. I think with Mourinho's methods, and this is no uncovering some great mystery, it's no incredible exclusive, we know Mourinho's methods are very much prodding and provoking players, uh, pushing them, seeing how they react, and seeing if he can spur them to better levels. He's done it at every club, pretty much, uh, and now he's doing it at Tottenham. Yeah, I know he is. You know, I know what's uh, the, the way things are happening. I've, you know... <sighs> Journalists have their sources and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to go into details, of course. But we know that's what's uh, the way he works. It's just a natural thing. And it's brought him an incredible level of success. He's one of the most successful managers in the history of football. Uh, there's no doubting it's brought results. However, it's a very jarring thing for a club like Tottenham, who, under Pochettino, it was a real thing about it being a very together, uh, family-type thing. Yes, it was eroding by the time that Pochettino had gone. Um, but it's this is so different, it's so jarring, um, and a lot of those players, you know, they'll be sniping, they'll be complaining, of course, this is what Hugo Lloris alluded to, or not even alluded to, he said it straight out, you know, if you're not in the team, stop complaining, support the team, and I get that, but I do feel that the way everything's been done by Mourinho, it, ultimately, he needs the players on his side, and his greatest strength and successes over the years have come from creating a them and us scenario with the outside world and it kind of almost feels like it's almost now a them and us within Tottenham and that's kind of doesn't 
I don't see how that works for me. Um, because, you know, clearly, uh, I think he's got the likes of Kane still on board. Kane's having a terrific season. Laurie certainly seems to be backing him with those words. You know, I think that was more aimed at other players. And obviously, he has, has certainly favourites uh, within the, the, the team that, that will stick by him. But it's, I think, when I talk about the fear factor, I think, you know, I get the sense, and he's done this in other clubs, of he thinks you can thrive from a player feeling that they can't be complacent, that they can't um, put in sub-par performances because they'll be out of the team. And I can get the logic behind that, uh, but you kind of need to have everyone having this incredibly strong mentality. And that's not how football or human nature works, you know? Um, everyone has different personalities. And yes, if you want to kind of go down a, maybe a stereotypical route, you could maybe suggest that perhaps in the modern era with so much money in the game uh, and more of a bubble mentality, I know we're all sick of hearing the word bubble, but you know what I mean, a bubble mentality to the way young footballers grow and come through the system, maybe not getting as much exposure to the outside real world and, and playing uh, in lower level football, like the academy system and how it works. Maybe mentally they're slightly more fragile. Maybe they are. I don't know. I'm just kind of putting that out there. But something about it just isn't working. And the problem with the fear factor element is what Mourinho's done. I mean, I touched on it with the defenders there. Those defenders must be so scared out of their wits of making a mistake because they could then be out of the uh, the team for 10 games in a row. You know, Sanchez... I think he was one of the casualties. It was over him. No, it was Alderweireld was one of the casualties of the Everton game. Then has only really played in little spurts of four or five games in a row. Probably would have played slightly more in the first half of the season until he got a little injury that kind of stopped one of those games. But since then, 2021 certainly, he's only played four games and then he's been out of the team for a while. Then four games and out of the team for a while. Sanchez, he's been the first name on the team sheet for the last, I think it's nine in a row in the Premier League. Maybe 10, because uh, he didn't play at Zagreb, did he? I don't think. Oh, my brain's gone. But yeah, so Sanchez clearly is... There's so many players that probably think, like, what? where do I stand, kind of thing. You know, are you going to ditch me? Am I not going to be in the team for two months? Or, or what happens? And that's also happening with the attacking ones, you know. I mean, we look at Deli Ali. There was a big thing about him coming back into the team. He's barely appeared since, you know. Um, Gareth Bale. Back in for a month, phenomenal month, some terrific performances. Has an iffy one against uh, North, in the North London derby, and now he's back to being a, a cameo role, occasionally coming on. It's like it's so fragmented, it's so broken, um, and you know that it's like you know Kane and Son are going to start every week. Hugo Lloris is going to start every week. Regulon probably always going to be the first choice left back, um, and at the moment, Hoybier and Bell are nailing down. Uh, the, the central midfield positions but every other position I kind of feel that any of them can put a foot wrong and then find themselves out of the team for a couple of months and it's just that's that fear factor I get the logic of you know oh yeah but it makes them not complacent they know they've got to perform at their best but it doesn't it kind of ends up making them nervous and that's why you see some of the rubbish mistakes like Sanchez was making and and at the other end you see people maybe not taking chances Wait, like Lamella's part, and Lamella is one of those who I always see as a risk taker, but it's holding on to the ball too long. And yes, I know he does that quite a lot <laughs> anyway. But some of these players are, um, I mean, say, let's use Son's example. Son, a player who, when he's absolutely full of confidence, uh, would have turned and hit that shot straight at goal, whereas instead he's trying to look and lay it off to someone that's not there. Um, so there's mistakes at both ends being made, really safe. Trying to do things safe ways rather than creative ways. And I think that's having a knock-on effect in the chances. Spurs should not be going to Newcastle and allowing Newcastle to create 22 chances, which I think was, I saw somewhere, is the most they've created at home in something like three, four years. And they're 17th in the table. They're absolutely having a mare of a season. Tottenham should not be going there and allowing them to create more. Tottenham are not taking games by the scruff of the neck. And I can see Mourinho is frustrated. He's He's coming out and saying, I'm not telling them to sit back. I'm telling them to go forward. But I do think the whole environment that's being created is not serving anyone. Um, and, you know, I think we'll see. I think the rest of the season will very much be... I've gone on a proper rant there. Apologies. Um, 
But I do think the next few months of the season are going to be defined pretty much by how Mourinho and the players' relationship. I think that's going to be so key. You know, there's a week between every game now, pretty much. Um, he's going to be able to pick the players he wants to pick. But there's this sense of, like, even um, at the weekend, Musa Soko has already come on as the third substitute. And then Newcastle, obviously, Willock scored, and it suddenly got changed to Bale coming on. And Bale had to come on for three minutes and try and save the day. Started with a terrible free kick. Um, but then, you know, Harry Kane's free kicks. Literally is his one Achilles. I've said literally a few times. I hate using that word. You know, but it is probably his Achilles heel. His one chink in his armour. Uh, is his free kick taking uh, Harry Kane? It's absolutely appalling. Other than the one that hit the post um, or woodwork at Man City, but yeah, so Bale's had to come on, barely played, dropped out of the team, and then Mourinho is having to turn to these players that he's kind of almost frozen out. You could go as far as saying, and then saying, "Yeah, please save us." And it's a bit like, Ugh, where's the? Yes, I know. In an ideal world, the motivation should be for the club. It should be for the badge. It should be for whatever you want it to be, but. Oh, your own self pride, but but of course there's a slight element of human nature. If if you've been snubbed and exiled or, or pushed to the side, you kind of kind of it's a part of you. It's kind of like, well, stuff you. Why am I doing this for you? And I, and I think I think we've seen that a few times this season. And I'm not saying I agree with it, but it is kind of a natural side effect of these things. And I think, like I say, I think the next few months are going to be about Mourinho is going to. If if I and again I'm spitballing, I'm not saying this is the case, but if if the plan for him and maybe the club is to go their separate ways in the summer, he still wants to end this season on a high. The players want to end this season on a high. Tottenham Hotspur are so close to Champions League football, it's almost in their own hands. Almost. It would have been. If West if they'd have won and West Ham hadn't, it would have been back in their hands. That's how close it is. And with one week, everything can change round again. Tottenham need Top four football, Champions League football next season would be huge for the club. Not just in a financial point of view, but also to get them back to where they want to be and where these players want to be and attracting players that want to play Champions League football. It's huge. Um, and also for, for Mourinho, if, it, if he is to move on in the summer, it's another thing for him. You know, he, he always makes out that the season that he finished second with Man U, um, and I can't remember, I think that was a trophy winning season as well, wasn't it? was his greatest achievement or right up there his greatest achievement because of how difficult the task was. And I kind of feel like he could probably himself, others might disagree, but he might be able to say at the end of this, if he gets Tottenham in the top four and say they win the cup final, it's a remarkable achievement with, with everything that has gone on this season. But I don't know, there's got to be some kind of coming together because ultimately for me, the three people that will decide Mourinho's fate are himself. A lot of it's down to him and how he deals with the players. Um, I think probably someone like Harry Kane will have a part to play. Harry Kane certainly is, whether he wants to be or not, is a very dominant, imposing presence at Tottenham Hotspur. And I think while if Kane were to also turn on Mourinho and voice his displeasure to the powers that be at the club, then I think you know the, the writing is on the wall. And obviously the third person is Daniel Levy, who, as I've always said, invested a lot in making this decision to bring a man that he's chased for two decades to the club and very much uh, he will want to give him every possible opportunity to make that uh, something that uh, was a successful decision. you know. And obviously at the moment, there hasn't there's been an improvement on last season, but there hasn't been an improvement on what came before it. And I think that's so key. So I think the summer's going to be really interesting. Um, and obviously it will depend on what happens in the next few weeks. But... Yeah, it's very, very, very strange time at Tottenham Hotspur. There's a lot of dissatisfied people, but there's also a feeling of, but we're still so close. And this is the thing, I see people about saying about get Mourinho out now, and I, I don't get that logic myself. I think if there's going to be a natural break, it would be in the summer. I think if you're going to do it now, I don't see candidates that come in on an interim basis. Because let's be honest, anyone at Tottenham wants seriously... Not going to be someone that is going to be able to come in now. Um, you know, as I've said before, you, uh, Julian Nagelsmann is someone I really, really like, um, and Brendan Rodgers is another. I think Brendan Rodgers has probably been even more difficult to get. But those kind of managers are not going to just down tools two months before the end of the season. It's not how it works. Um, and there's no real managers for me that you'd bring in from the outside uh, who I think would be happy just to do it for a couple of months. 
they would want the job permanently. And then you look inside and you look at someone like Lidley King or Ryan Mason. For me, it's so inexperienced right now. So, so, so inexperienced. Um, I, I don't think that would work myself. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't get that let's get him out now logic. I don't think this whole thing about the new manager bounce, which we've seen, you know, stats, everyone looks into it. I don't know how the expression is still going because... There's the stats show that new manager bounce actually doesn't happen more often than not. So, yeah, I don't get it. I say definitely everyone sits down in the summer and looks at where we're going, um, whether it's progression and whether there's a way forward. I think that's a different thing. But right now, it's so close. It's so close. Just they could just get a little bit of momentum. Everything changes. Absolutely everything changes. Big weekend this weekend. Um, I'm back inside the stadium, which is wonderful. Um, apologies, that sounds like I was rubbing it in, but you guys will be back soon. It's not long now. Carabao Cup final. We're going to uh, certainly get some fans back. Obviously, depends how much of a, a portion of those are actually um, given out to, to fans. But obviously, also, I think we're going to get the last home game, hopefully, of the season. Um, I think it's going to be a rearranged, isn't it, to fit in? So we'll see. But you guys will be back. But yeah, this Sunday, Manchester United, you know, they're playing uh, tomorrow night, aren't they? Um, what are we on Wednesday? I'm losing track of time. They're playing this week, obviously. Um, yeah, it's tomorrow night in Granada, isn't it? Um, Granada. Yeah, it's Granada. So they might have might be slightly slightly more knackered. They might pick up a couple of injuries. Who knows what happens? Although we've been here before. We said this about Arsenal before North London Derby. And Spurs look like the knackered team. So, um, yeah, it doesn't always work like that. But it could play a part. And it does mean that Mourinho has a whole week to drill these players. Um, but it's it's such a crunch match for me. Um, Spurs need they need momentum this month. They need it massively. They need to, you know, Mourinho can look at it and he can say, look, we've only lost two of nine games. We've won six of those. Uh, lost only two of them, albeit awful de- defeats. Um, but they need to they need to pick up momentum. I feel like I've said that so many times, but they do. You know, you've got Man United, Everton, Southampton, and the um, Carabao Cup final. They can get through this month. Um, May opens up so much better for them because I think I was looking at the fixtures and I think Chelsea have got a bit of a nightmare running. I think Liverpool have probably got the easiest if I remember correctly. But Spurs need to be getting in a position where it's in their hands. If they can get it into a position where it's somewhat in their hands in May, I think they've got a good run of games to be able to do it. But they've got to get there. Um, and like I say, just need a bit of harmony behind the scenes. That's that's where it needs to be at. We need to see... Um, I think we know the way the game's likely to go on Sunday. I think we know it's going to be a compact breaking against the on the counter-attack kind of performance. But everyone has to be absolutely 100% up for it. Man United are going to be still reeling from that uh, big old defeat earlier in the season at Old Trafford. Um, And, you know, it's a game that Spurs massively need to win. They really do, because if they start getting off the pace, this is what I say, although it's very tight at the moment, a couple of defeats, and I think then you're struggling massively to even get maybe in the top six how tight it can be up there. So, uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Like I say, Friday is going to be really interesting, the press conference. We certainly will be asking him about various things. Um, Injury-wise, I don't think there are any fresh ones, were there, from the weekend. I think it's likely to just be uh, an update on uh, Davies and um, Doherty. Um, But yeah, please get back to winning ways. It would be a massive statement. If they could do it against Man U at home, um, I think that would be a big statement victory. But... If they play anything like they did, I'd say I'd say in the last four games, and I'd include Villa Park as well, I think there's got to be better. They've got to be much better. They've got to be more togetherness. Um, and that's going to be key. That's going to be key to the rest of the season. So there you go. Right. Oh, oh, one thing, just before I head off, I wanted to say, um, many people, and it's very kind of you, have been asking in the comments about, uh, can you put this in a podcast format? Um, I used to always reply to this with this explanation, but I kind of... I haven't bothered so much in the past because otherwise I'd be repeating myself so much. But hopefully if anyone's got to the end of this video, you'll see this. Um, the reason I haven't been able to put these in a podcast is my work. I understand it. Very um, uh, kind of politely asked me. 
Uh, they are looking to relaunch their own podcast, which I used to do with them uh, a couple of when did we we closed that off a couple of years back now. They're looking to bring that back soon. Uh, so they kindly asked, would it be possible not to have this in a podcast form? Just because I have a, in a way, I suppose I'm going up rival as a competition to my own work, which I, I totally understand that. So it's absolutely fine. You know, they don't have their own YouTube channel. So this isn't any kind of competition uh, for them. So I understand that. I mean, it's maybe something that might happen in the future. Uh, literally me just taking the audio from this podcast, but that will that that would be in the, in, in the future. Uh, and it would have to be something that, Obviously, I'd talk to my work about it. It depended on the state of whether their stuff has launched or not. But I do appreciate people asking. I understand it's easier to listen to this um, in a podcast format because you can listen to it on the go. Although I think some people are saying there's ways of listening to it on YouTube uh, and being able to be on the go and turning it off and stuff like that. So that's the reason why I don't do it and I can't do it right now. Um, hopefully in the near future, I can sort something out and I can do that. Uh, but otherwise, I'm afraid you're going to have to stuck looking at this mug. Um, but yeah, and I'm sure people will continue to ask it underneath, but if you've watched this, please do reply to them. It saves me having to explain it to them, but yeah, maybe something for the future. Um, yeah, again, thanks for viewing though. Honestly, it's always much appreciated. It is just a bloke whinging away or getting overexcited, which sounds weird on his sofa. Um, but yeah, it's very cathartic. It does help. It does help me. I passed 2 million uh, views on here a couple of weeks back. Um, and it is very, as I said in my tweets about it, I really enjoy it, I do. Um, it gets a lot of it out of my system, and apologies if I ramble and I I get annoyed at times, and you know, certainly some of the earlier stuff today of kind of ranting about the way people use social media and stuff like that, but uh, sorry to come across as an old man. But there you go. But hopefully, hopefully, I'll have some positive stuff to talk about after this weekend. Uh, things will turn in a bit of a different direction, and... Uh, and Mourinho can start kind of healing the squad together. You know, it's all about he might have concerns, he might have issues with certain players and certain performances, but ultimately they're looking to him for guidance um, and and to kind of make them feel secure. I know that doesn't sound great. I know people don't like that, but ultimately it's kind of the way football and, and human minds work. Um, they want to be believed in. Um, so, yeah. So there you go. So as always, stay safe, stay healthy, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Bye.